today I'm talking to Keith Littman, the president and co-founder of Prosper Elwear. Keith, welcome. Since uh, Prosper Elwear has now been going for about five years, I believe, and when you first started, you were very much in the uh, add-ons for Worksite and SharePoint sector. Where are you going now? What's what's changing? So, um, when we founded the company in 2009, we had really um, we founded it with the idea of getting into legal project management. The challenge that we saw at that point was I couldn't define how to build a piece of software that would actually address any business problem. I mean, no one really understood what legal project management was, and if I probably tried to build something in 2009, we probably would have ended up with the, with in essence, a product that looked like a product recently removed from the market. <laughs> um, so instead, what we did is we waited, and so we started building those the add-ons for Worksite and tried to understand basically, you know, what else, you know, what else out there? Let's listen to the market. Is LPM maturing? Is there something going on? And so we did that in about 2012 we said okay i think it's finally time to go look and see if it's time to finally build what we originally started to do and we started talking to the market the fundamental difference in the market today is just this very very simple idea let's say before 2007 the phone would ring and you know the client would call and say i have some work for you the lawyer would say how wonderful give me the details and I will open the matter and we'll start working. And the client would then probably say, how much is it going to cost? And the lawyer would go, I don't know. Every matter is different. I can't tell you how much it's going to cost. It costs what it costs. And the client would be happy with that answer and move on. Pat, you know, going into the recession, that changed. And fundamentally, when the client asked how much it's going to cost, they actually were demanding an answer. And when they started doing that, the lawyers would give an answer. And of course, as anyone who's ever bought anything or negotiated anything knows is, once you give a price, you've set the price. Mm -hmm. And so those numbers really come to light saying, okay, if you told me it cost 100,000, my expectation will cost 100,000. And when it costs 500,000, I'm kind of upset. The type of work you're, talk, you're talking about, though, is very much the, if you like, the high-end commercial negotiation stuff. Because, I mean, here in the UK, we've been having fixed-priced work for fairly simple consumer-type stuff for a long time now. Yeah, I think that's, the, I think that's a great observation. The, what we're really seeing is this is an, an issue for large law firms who do business-to-business -business work. And that's fundamental difference. It's not really about law firms who do business, you know, basically mm. to consumers. These mm. are, you know, sophi generally sophisticated buyers who are now saying, "I want a price even on some of the most sophisticated type of work." Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that some of the uh, pressure is coming from we're getting a new generation of, if you like, general counsel who are far more aggressive in their pricing. Was in the past, it always seemed to be. I don't know. They 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 felt def they, they always seemed slightly deferential towards law firm partners. Now they seem to be the other way around and far more uh, commercially minded. I, I think it's both the new general counsel, but I also think it's the CEOs and boards have also really made a fundamental change there. So I think the difference is is kind of going back to what happened is that many of the CEOs said, you know something, you know that director of operations who has to predict what our exact demand is going to be, what is the variation on the cost of, you know, what oil is going to do to affect his transportation costs and deliver an exacting budget so that we know our exact margins. He can predict that with all that variability. You can figure out what the legal work's gonna cost. Um, one of the things you've introduced with your uh, legal process management is the con concept of a maturity model. Can you explain a little bit about this? And we do have a, a slide that will yeah. be shown. So if we look at the five steps, really it's step one, we want them to budget and monitor. Step two, we want them to really start understanding what do they do? Mm -hmm. and, and from that perspective, that can simply understand is, 
I actually deliver this service or this process and it's about this area of law and have that understanding. Unfortunately for most law firms, they're, that they don't have, universally, they're not in good shape in that, in that way. Um, I also can start understanding and developing what is, once I've understood what I do, what are the phases of that work? From there, they can start do it, start, we, the, the firms can start asking the lawyers to code their work to the phases. Then we can get some understanding of, and some knowledge of this, you know, e-disclosure phase typically costs us this with its, these subject areas or this complexity or some other issue. We also kind of then get to step three. And in step three, we basically can say, what, what's inefficient? Or, or what I prefer to say is what's the stupid stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, you know, if the associate does not know what he's supposed to do and comes out with the wrong result and then has to redo it, we know when the partner goes to bill that time, the first thing that's gonna happen is he's gonna have to write down those 20 hours. And that's an effect to profitability. Step four is finally when we're starting to get to project management or process management. You know, and that's really defining in some ways how do we have a ta a set of, you know, basically design our matter by sets of tasks and say, okay, it's gonna be take a deposition, it's gonna be review documents, this could be draft a contract, and defining under each one of those, what are the sub, what are the activities? Breaking it the, down into the components. Yeah. 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 What are the different activities and what is gonna happen along the way? And then finally, step five is actually managing to the checklist and actually getting to project management. Yeah. Which is where you can actually start saying the whole idea of Lean Sigma Six could actually be useful. Can we, can we just come in on Lean Six, Sigma Six? Because I know a lot of lawyers will immediately roll their eyes and say, isn't this just management consultants coming up with a new toy to try and extricate large amounts of money from us? I, it, it could be, but I think, it, I, I think the challenge with Lean Sigma is once you've gotten through this evolution and you actually can understand what you do, where you're inefficient and what's going on, and then start addressing that, you have an opportunity to really do process improve, true process you know, re-engineering all the time. I think that the I think the challenge though is to really get there, you actually have to understand where the inefficiency is. And that only happens when you really start managing to a very detailed level of wait, because I did these four steps, I had to pull the documents. It took me two hours to pull the documents. However, if we re-engineer it and we do these three steps, I can do that in half the time. Those types of observations only come with lots of rich coded data. Can I just come in here about the people side of things? Because it's one of the things I've noticed. Lawyers still seem the individual lawyer, never mind what the management may be saying, that the, 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 the individual lawyer still tends to think of hitting their targets for billable hours and you hear them say, why should we invest in technologies that allow us to do a job in one hour when previously we did it in four hours and could bill for four hours? Now, again, this goes back to some fundamental inefficiencies, but is this element being overcome? Is this sort of this lawyer mindset? Well, let's go back to our kind of, let's, let's talk about back to that. If the client knows that the thing, that either you've priced it at 100,000 and they will only pay 100,000 or they're aware that this is what it should cost, the fact that you were inefficient and spent four hours, the client is gonna take their red pen out and go, I will only pay one hour for this task. The three hours just went out, out the door. So one of the other things I believe Umbria does is something called experience management. Right. What, what exactly is experience management? So, uh, so it, it sounds again, a little bit management consultancy speak. It probably is with all management consultancy speak. <laughs> um, so, I mean, let, let's boil it down. And, and so one of the things I've learned about Matt firms is some of the challenges is we have traditionally asked lawyers for their, for information about a matter, right? And that information about the matter is the matter type, the area of law, 
other information that allows you to use it. Why have you asked for that over the years? It's really asked, it was originally asked by the business development folks. But the other advantage of starting to collect experience data is that we have another audience who wants the data, not just the business development folks for the partners to put the, their pitches together, but the partners themselves or the pricing professionals who basically say, okay, I knew we, we did last year five of this. Find it for me so and I want to know how much they cost. And some, you know, it could be the CFO, it could be somebody else starts going in even into their traditional PMS or time billing system and basically does that search and says, it doesn't look like you did any of those last mm -hmm. year. The partner gets all mm -hmm. huffed up and says, I know I did five. And so the, generally the CFO then goes into the partner's office with the printout and says, here is the list of actually what you did last year. And he goes, and probably goes through and looks at the list and goes, no, that was not a trust in estate work. That was not a trust in estate work. That was not trust in estate work. And suddenly the CFO goes, yes, because trust, the reason is probably that is trust in estates is the first one on the list on what's the matter type. Mm -hmm. Because basically you're asking for data that no one cares about at the moment of matter opening. So our, our approach to managing experience is to get that data. So it sounds like you're trying to tie a financial incentive to knowledge management. I, I, I actually, I agree with that. I mean, I really think that, you know, knowledge has struggled with, you know, what is the value? I think not the, the knowledge management teams actually have a wonderful opportunity because as this pricing pressure continues, you know, the interest in templates, the interest in precedent, the interest in all this stuff is going to increase. And then having great, you know, metadata or great experience information on matters actually allows them to go, oh, let's find the really good templates. Let's actually go and look because we have someone worried about rich metadata. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the one comment I would make is this does, it still doesn't come for free, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to have to set it, but you're creating much, much better organizational requirements mm -hmm. around this type yeah. of information. Yeah. You're aligning partners and business development and knowledge and get everybody rowing in the same way. Yeah. What next then for Prospero Aware? You know, we are focused on, you know, uh, all of our products, you know, deliver, you know, we're delivering, continue delivering a lot of additional functionality around the document in the document management space. And we're continuing to really focus on working on Umbria the, the interesting thing about Umbria is now that we've aligned lots of metadata with lots of finance materials, we can really start applying big data and big data algorithms to these problems. I'll say law firms really don't have big data in some ways. You know, but they can still draw the same inferences from the data they've got that large organizations Absolutely. Can do. Yeah. 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 So, you know. Yeah. You can look at it, you could conceptually use ideas like some of the big dig out algorithms that um, some of the big retailers use to go figure out that we should put the beer near the diapers mm -hmm. because when men, men go, go to buy diapers, they also buy beer. Mm -hmm. I mean, those type of algorithms could be similarly used in law firms to do some very, very interesting things. Mm. Hmm. I'm just pondering that, okay, beer and diapers in a law firm scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, it's been very interesting to hear about how Prospero is developing. Thank you, Charles.